There was a tradition in the ancient world, a, a whole age of art, as Hegel discusses, where art and statuary and architecture served a different purpose than it does now. It was a time when the highest purpose of art was served. Art was used to express and transmit these timeless truths and these immutable laws that underpinned reality. So when we say that cultures tended to incorporate their most venerated memes, their central cultural values, their most cherished ideas, in the ancient world, in ancient Egypt in particular, the thing that was most revered and the thing that the aesthetic was based on was wisdom itself. It was definitely an expression of that old maxim, truth is beauty and beauty is truth. Art was the expression of these timeless truths and immutable laws that underpinned physical reality. Did you ever have one of those synchronicities where you learn a new word and then almost immediately someone around you says that word? This is one of those times. Here are some terms that are going to become important for you in the immediate near future. Didactic. Didactic means to teach. Didactic art is designed to teach or transmit something. Didactic architecture and didactic statuary is the same thing. Why is this important? You'll see. So ancient religious art is didactic, and that means it's designed to teach. And more specifically, it's designed to teach metaphysical principles through the language of symbolism. One of the most famous examples of this is the, the medieval cathedrals, the Gothic cathedrals, which were very much uh, religious books in stone you know, that they conveyed the entire Christian doctrine through, through statuary and architecture and symbolism. And this same idea of the, the cathedral as didactic edifice traces back to, to the Egyptian temple. The idea of the temple as didactic edifice uh, and, a, and a, a structure designed to teach the, the principles, the metaphysical principles of the Egyptian civilization. The ancients understood that the human body was the temple of the soul and was just as holy in its own way. And in certain instances, they actually reproduced the body or various parts of the body to represent cosmic functions. And so in Egypt, as Schwaller's magisterial scholarship demonstrates to us, the Temple of Luxor is built to exactly the proportions of the, of the male skeleton. And of course in Egypt, other portions of the body were also used to express particular cosmic functions. The face of Hathor, and this is now accepted even by Egyptologists, in fact it was an Egyptologist who discovered it, who was no longer remembered for having discovered it, A. A. Barb back in the 1950s, that the face of Hathor represents a uterus. And Hathor is of course the mother of all, her name means the mother of Horus. So we find wherever we look, and I'm sure that the, um, that the, that the Hindus and in Vedic India also um, built according to these same, this same understanding and principles. In fact, when Shwala de Lubitsch published, or was ready to publish his, his grand work, The Temple of Man, Le Temple de l'Homme, he stopped, he downed tools for a bit, because at that time, a book, a massive study called The Hindu Temple by a, um, a scholar of Vedic and, and Hindu doctrine, Stella Kramrish, uh, produced her book and Schwaller was amazed and delighted to find that the same geometric and the same geometric and harmonic and numerical principles that were in place and commanded the structure of Luxor were also used by the Hindus and found expression yet again in the Gothic cathedrals specifically or perhaps most significantly in Chartres. So the knowledge was handed down. 